I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. The year was 1985. Ronald Reagan was sworn in as President of the United States for a second term. Richard Dawson gave a long, impassioned speech at the end of his final daytime episode of Family Feud on ABC. The charity single, We Are the World by USA for Africa, raised over $63 million for humanitarian causes. Back to the Future became the year's highest grossing film. Commodore launched their personal computer, the Amiga 1000. Thundercats made its television debut in syndication. Microsoft released Windows. But in the North American video game industry, sales of video games had dropped from 1982's 3.2 billion to a mere 100 million dollars. It wasn't until October 18th of that year that the industry would begin anew, thanks to Nintendo. Gaming Delight presents the story of the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nintendo, from the Japanese term for leave luck to heaven, was founded in 1889 as a card playing company. As the years went on, Nintendo ventured into love hotels, toys, and eventually video games. Nintendo even partnered with Magnavox to create optoelectronic guns for the Magnavox Odyssey. Nintendo would eventually go on to create the color TV game consoles as well as the Game & Watch and of course, some popular arcade games such as Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers, and Popeye. This success led Nintendo to create their very first home video game console. Our story begins in Japan in the early 1980s. Following the worldwide success of their popular arcade games, Nintendo made plans to develop a console. Not that it would be their first attempt. In 1977, in a collaboration with Mitsubishi Electronics, they came out with their very own series of systems, Color TV Game Consoles. But these systems were limited to only having built-in games in each unit. But that's another story. Under the leadership of Masayuki Uemura, Nintendo's research and development team was assigned to design a video game console. One that would play games using interchangeable cartridges similar to systems like the Atari 2600, ColecoVision, Intellivision, and many others. But this system would have to take at least a year for other companies to copy its specifications, and it would also have to be affordable. Although 16-bit processors were available at the time, they were too expensive and would have easily driven up the price tag, so Nintendo settled on 8-bit processors. All the while, Nintendo of Japan President Hiroshi Yamauchi negotiated a deal with Rico and ordered 3 million microchips to try and keep the cost down. Other cost-cutting measures included having the controllers hardwired to the system and removing out-of-the-box computer peripherals. Nintendo did, however, include an expansion port in the system's design. The controllers were also made more simplistic. Instead of joysticks, the directional pad, or D-pad, from the Game & Watch handheld systems was used, along with two main buttons, B and A. The first controller would also include start and select buttons, while the second would include a microphone. After numerous technical experiments and countless hours of engineering, the Famicom was ready to be launched. The system was initially given the code name GameCon. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? However, inspired by his wife, Uemura renamed the system Famicom, short for Family Computer. On July 13, 1983, Nintendo launched the Famicom in Japan. It sold at a retail price of 14,800 yen, more than Hiroshi Yamauchi expected. However, at the time, it was equivalent to $65 in United States currency, 
and compared to Atari, Coleco, and Mattel's offerings, it was a far greater deal. With the release of the Famicom came three launch titles, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye, home console ports of Nintendo's popular arcade games. Thanks to well-placed advertising, over 500,000 units were sold. However, Nintendo began receiving calls concerning the system freezing. The research and development team scrambled to find the problem. They did. A circuit with a faulty design caused the crashes. Hiroshi Yamauchi decreed that every Famicom unit on the market must be recalled for repair. This decision cost Nintendo serious money, but in the end, it was worth it. The Famicom was reissued with a new motherboard, and sales went through the roof. And by the end of 1984, it became the best-selling system in Japan, selling over 2.5 million units. To add to that, their competition was minimal. On the same day the Famicom was launched, their rival Sega launched their first console, the Sega SG-1000, at a price of 15,000 yen. This system could never keep up with the Famicom, and the Atari 2800, the Japanese version of the 2600, practically did nothing. With control of over 90% of the Japanese video game market, Nintendo knew the Famicom was ready for the West. As a matter of fact, even before the Famicom launched, Nintendo had tried negotiating a deal with another major video game conglomerate. Nintendo originally had a strong relationship with Coleco, to whom they licensed Donkey Kong to be released on home consoles. However, Hiroshi Yamauchi had another company in mind. In the early 1980s, it felt as if Atari could do no wrong. The Atari Video Computer System, also known as the Atari 2600, was selling like hotcakes. Games such as Asteroids, Breakout, Space Invaders, Missile Command, Yars Revenge, and Combat helped drive sales. And then there was the Atari 5200, their answer to the ColecoVision and Mattel's Intellivision. But none of its games were compelling enough, and its controllers were notorious for their non-centering joysticks. And along came Pac-Man for the Atari 2600. Although it sold more than 7 million copies, nearly 5 million were left unsold. And by the end of 1982, Atari's version of E.T. the Extraterrestrial only sold 1.5 million out of the 5 million cartridges manufactured. But that's a topic for another video. During the first half of 1983, Nintendo approached Atari about a deal to distribute the Famicom outside of Japan. Nintendo of America Vice President Howard Lincoln was quoted as saying, Mr. Yamauchi said, why don't you contact the Atari people? So I called Ray Kassar, and the next thing we knew, we were going down in a corporate jet to Warner. Lincoln contacted Atari's chairman, Ray Kassar, explaining that Nintendo was inclined to license the rights to sell the Famicom outside of Japan to Atari. Kassar was all in, so Lincoln flew on a Gulfstream jet to Atari's headquarters, alongside Nintendo of America president and Yamauchi's son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa. At Nintendo and Atari's first meeting, Arakawa explained the specifications of the Famicom and answered an array of questions from executives and attorneys. Not long afterwards, Atari's senior vice president Skip Paul and a group of Atari managers flew to Kyoto, Japan for a follow-up meeting with Yamauchi, Arakawa, and Lincoln. The Famicom was demonstrated by Masayuki Uemura, who explained why it surpassed systems that came before it. Throughout the meeting, Yamauchi came and went repeatedly. He wanted to make it look as though he had more important matters to deal with. In the week that followed, there was constant haggling over percentage points of royalties. Despite that, Nintendo was getting pretty much all that they wanted. Finally, Lincoln took advantage of one of Yamauchi's disappearances by claiming he was losing patience and that he might back out if nothing was sewn up. With that, Skip Paul and the other Atari representatives retreated to a private room to contact Ray Kassar. When the team returned, Paul asked Lincoln to write up the contracts. Said Howard Lincoln, I mean, it was a done deal. We spent a week putting this thing together, this elaborate agreement in Kyoto. Skip Paul was over there. We had the whole thing put together. It was a deal. According to the terms, Atari would purchase complete Nintendo products 
that Nintendo would manufacture, thereby giving Nintendo most of the proceeds. Atari would then sell the products outside of Japan as their own. In return, Nintendo would produce four Atari games for the Famicom. So it was agreed that Lincoln, Arakawa, Yamauchi, and Paul would meet again at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in June of 1983 to sign on the dotted line. It felt too good to be true. And then it happened. Atari found a new version of Donkey Kong being shown off at Coleco's CES booth. Like I said earlier, Coleco had the home console rights to Donkey Kong. Atari had the home computer rights to the game. Atari felt as though they were double-crossed. The version of Donkey Kong they saw was running on Coleco's new Atom computer system. Atari threatened to cancel the deal and seek legal action against Nintendo. That evening, Nintendo called for an emergency meeting with Coleco. Hiroshi Yamauchi pointed at Coleco President Arnold Greenberg and shouted at him in Japanese. Greenberg argued that his company had no idea they nearly destroyed a potential deal between two major gaming companies. He also considered the Atom a gaming system with the exterior of a computer. He also tried to pin the blame for the misunderstanding on Howard Lincoln. Yamauchi didn't buy Greenberg's feeble excuses. He demanded Coleco refrain from selling Donkey Kong for the Atom, or there would be lawsuits from Nintendo. Serious lawsuits. As soon as Coleco's execs left the suite, Yamauchi calmly turned to Lincoln. Sometimes, this is the way you have to handle people, Mr. Lincoln, he said. What did you think of that performance? However, things only got worse. Atari had reported more than half a billion dollars in losses. Ray Kassar was fired, and numerous employees were laid off. So much for their deal with Nintendo. To further complicate matters, by 1983, the video game market in North America had crashed. There was a plethora of consoles and poor games littering the market home computers coming down in price, poor quality control, and a shortage of consumer confidence. As a result, games were popping up in bargain bins for as little as 10% of their original prices. How was Nintendo going to get the Famicom to North America? Even though their deal with Atari went south, Nintendo was still interested in bringing the Famicom to North America, but they knew the video game industry was in a major slump. As a result of the video game crash of 1983, Warner Communications split Atari in half and sold the Consumer Electronics Division to Jack Trammell in 1984, who renamed it Atari Corporation. In 1985, the arcade division, Atari Games, was sold to Namco, who sold it back two years later. Coleco and Mattel called it quits on their consoles due to the crash and focused on their toy lines. But Nintendo wasn't ready to give up. Minoru Arakawa saw that despite the crash, people were still pouring into arcades in North America. He felt that the video game crash was not a result of a loss of interest, but of poor marketing. He knew the Famicom was capable of bringing the arcade experience to households. Even though no other company could negotiate a deal with Nintendo, Arakawa figured the company would disassociate from Atari, Mattel, and Coleco's consoles if the Famicom was marketed as a sophisticated electronics item. To entice retailers, Arakawa wanted the system to look more like a computer. As I said in the last chapter, the video game crash was the result of numerous factors, one of them being a rise in sales of personal computers. Why buy just a video game from Atari or Intellivision? Invest in the wonder computer of the 1980s for under $300, the Commodore VIC-20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. Nintendo's research and development teams in Kyoto set to work on modifying the Famicom as Nintendo's team in North America designed the console's housing and packaging. Designer Lance Barr fit the main computer board and circuitry into a sleek and high-tech box. The console was called the Advanced Video System. However, there was still more work to be done. Ron Judy, Vice President of Marketing for Nintendo of America, suggested that a security system be added to the AVS. With that, engineers were tasked with creating one. With the security system, the AVS would only work if the security chip inside the system would communicate successfully with the chip in the cartridge, otherwise the game would freeze. This security system would prevent counterfeiters from making games without Nintendo's approval. A clever gesture to maintain quality control and prevent poor games from overflowing the market. During development of the security system, Arakawa asked designer Don James to recommend the best Nintendo games for the AVS. 
James, alongside warehouse manager Howard Phillips, played a bundle of games and gave Arakawa a list of their favorites. Arakawa sent instructions to Japan so they could prepare English language versions of 40 games. The AVS was to debut at the 1985 Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Arakawa, Lincoln, James, and Phillips arrived at the show with AVS demos and brochures. They announced, the evolution of a species is now complete. The advanced video system had two wireless controllers, a joystick, and a zapper gun, as well as a cassette drive for custom data and a keyboard, similar to the Famicom's Family Basic and Data Recorder. But when asked if they could place an order, retailers scoffed. They weren't fooled by the design and peripherals. They thought it was an expensive video game system. No one bought it. Said Howard Lincoln, the memories of Atari were too recent. That's when Nintendo decided to switch gears yet again, this time with the help of their own Trojan horse. What's a Trojan horse, you might ask? It goes like this. After the decade-long war between ancient Greece and the city of Troy reached the stalemate, the Greeks left the giant wooden horse in front of the gates of Troy and sailed the entire army away. The Trojans brought the horse across the gates and celebrated what appeared to be their triumph. But late that night, when the Trojans were asleep, out of the horse came Greek soldiers. They opened the city gates, allowing the returning Greek army to burst into Troy and destroy the city, winning the war. Since then, the Trojan horse has become one of the most well-known stories in Greek mythology. To this day, it's become a metaphor, a way of subverting or defeating from within through deception. Nintendo had one of their own. Since retailers wouldn't accept the advanced video system after the 1983 video game crash, Nintendo chose to differentiate the system from consoles even further and package it with a cool peripheral. After the advanced video system failed to catch on at the Winter Consumer Electronics Show, Nintendo conducted another plan. Distinguish the Famicom from video game consoles even further and lower the price tag. For the latter, Nintendo removed the computer peripherals. For the former, Don James and Lance Barr gave the Famicom one final makeover. A black and gray box in which one would load games akin to inserting a video cassette into a VCR. It was renamed the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short. Meanwhile, Nintendo's Research and Development One team was put in charge of designing a new peripheral for the Famicom, and eventually the NES. General Manager Gunpei Yokoi, engineer extraordinaire and designer of the Game & Watch handhelds, came up with a toy robot. They named it Family Computer Robot. Nintendo of Japan shipped a unit to the West for review. At Nintendo of America's headquarters in Redmond, Washington, Howard Phillips opened the package and tested out its contents. Phillips pushed a button. The TV screen flashed, sending a signal to the robot. The robot began to move slowly. As it did, a grinding noise was heard, very loud. Phillips and his colleagues broke into laughter. According to IGN, marketing manager Gail Tilden recalled, that thing was definitely like watching grass grow. It was so slow and to try and stand there and sales pitch it in person and to try to make it exciting, you had to have the eyes lined up just right or it wouldn't receive the flashes. It was kind of a challenge. Tilden christened the Famicom robot Robotic Operating Buddy, or Rob for short. Despite all the fun they poked at it, Nintendo of America knew Rob was just what they needed to differentiate the Nintendo Entertainment System from any console that came before it. And to further de-emphasize the system's new design, Nintendo added a redesigned zapper gun to the package. On June of 1985, Nintendo of America presented the Nintendo Entertainment System and Rob the Robot at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show. It was a huge improvement over the winter CES earlier that year. Retailers did find Rob amusing, but they still didn't feel like placing orders. Minoru Arakawa then decided to commission focus group studies in New Jersey. He observed a sampling of young boys behind a one-way mirror, but the reception he received was vulgar. He then contacted Hiroshi Yamauchi, considering throwing in the towel. Yamauchi wouldn't have it. Try to sell the system in one city, and if it fails, it fails, he said. But we must get it into the hands of the customer. That is the only test that matters. He ultimately decided on releasing the system in New York City. 
Being the largest city in the United States with a competitive market, it was sure to give them a worthwhile sample size. Nintendo's plan to get their console into North American store shelves was about to come to fruition. In late summer of 1985, Nintendo of America carried out their mission to get the Nintendo Entertainment System onto store shelves. On a budget of $50 million, they rented a warehouse in Hackensack, New Jersey and set to work. Employees of both Nintendo of America and Nintendo of Japan were flown in. When they got to the warehouse, Minoru Arakawa cheered his group on. He said, If we can just get players to see it, it will be really big. I know we can do it. It's a big job but everything worthwhile is difficult. We just have to get it to the players. If we do, it will be really, really big. To further entice retailers, the company decided not to mention the term video game anywhere on the packaging for the NES, nor in any ads. The system itself was called a control deck. Cartridges were called game packs, and the whole platform was called an entertainment system. As for the game packs, covers featured sprites from the games anything to set them as far apart as possible from video game consoles. Then came a strong proposal. Minoru Arakawa offered to have Nintendo stock stores and set up the displays at no cost. After 90 days, they would only pay Nintendo for every console sold and return the unsold stock. This decision was made without Hiroshi Yamauchi's permission. Retailers thought Nintendo was off their gourd, but with nothing to lose, they relented. Nintendo worked day in and day out setting up displays at over 500 retail stores in New York and New Jersey. The biggest and most important was a 15 square foot area at FAO Schwartz, one of the most famous toy stores in the world, and the oldest in the United States. On October 9, 1985, Nintendo held a launch party for the NES, despite there being next to no press to cover it, even though there had been invites. On October 18, 1985, the Nintendo Entertainment System Deluxe Set launched in North America with Rob the Robot as the main attraction of Nintendo's advertising. There are many claims as to the regular suggested retail price, but most claim $179.99. Adjusted for inflation? That's around $437 now. However, by December of that year, the price dropped pretty quickly. Some stores, such as Toys R Us, sold it for as low as $139.97. The system launched with 17 titles. The deluxe set was packaged with the following. The NES, two controllers, the needed hookups, Rob the Robot, a zapper gun, and two games, Gyromite and Duck Hunt. It was also packaged with Rob's attachment with which to play Gyromite. At malls, Nintendo of America set up booths with at least 12 monitors, each attached to a Nintendo Entertainment System. At one mall, Nintendo had worked overnight to set up its booth. And just as the crowds came in, the director of the mall came over and wouldn't allow them to turn on the games, saying they attract the wrong sort of crowd. All this skepticism made Nintendo wonder, were they doing the right thing? It was an uphill battle. Even with the no-risk offers, these fancy displays and whatnot, as well as the promise of a promotional campaign of $5 million, it took three calls to win over most stores. A buyer would finally be taken in, but then a merchandising manager would just say, forget it. When he was convinced, a vice president wouldn't budge, but Nintendo refused to give up, and more stores were on their side. Under Ron Judy's supervision, Gail Tilden ran the ad campaign, as well as press relations. Despite knowing next to nothing about advertising a video game system, Nintendo learned that the trick was to include employees in the ads. Commercials included Rob hatching out of an egg, houses blasting off into space, and of course, kids playing the NES. All their efforts began to pay off. More and more stores kept placing orders. More systems and games were shipped out to retailers all over New York. Work kept on going until Christmas Eve. Over half a thousand stores were selling the NES. All the mall tours and advertising succeeded in building interest in the Nintendo Entertainment System. Sales were skyrocketing. It wasn't as Nintendo had hoped it would be, but over half of the 100,000 systems shipped from Japan had been sold, and retailers had decided that the NES was viable. It was enough for Nintendo of America to keep on going. 
On February of 1986, Nintendo launched a second test market in Los Angeles. More test markets were launched in Chicago, San Francisco, and several cities in Texas. By June of 1986, the Nintendo Entertainment System was shipped nationwide. Let's go over the NES itself. It has a power and reset button and two controller ports. And if you open the door on the front, you'll see the loading tray with a pin connector. On the left side of the system, you have ports for composite video cables, something the original Famicom lacked. On the back, you have the AC adapter input, the channel switch, and the RF input. On the bottom, you'll see this compartment. This was supposed to be an expansion port, but Nintendo never utilized it. Shame. The controller is rectangular shape. It has a D-pad, a select button, a start button, a B button, and an A button. Plug it into one of the controller ports and you're good to go. And that's basically it for the unit itself. As I mentioned earlier, compared to the Famicom's launch, which only had three titles, the Nintendo Entertainment System launched with 17 titles. Let's go over them. Baseball. Very self-explanatory. It was developed by Nintendo's Research and Development 1 team and designed by Shigeru Miyamoto. It was first released on December 7, 1983 for the Famicom in Japan. Obviously, the object of the game is to score the most runs. Nintendo didn't have a license from any baseball league to use team names or player names, but it's said that the initials were meant to represent actual team names. Gameplay-wise, uniform colors were the only thing distinguishing the two teams. During the NES's launch period in North America, MLB players were brought in to play this game on a big projector screen. This was a bold move for Nintendo. It helped drive sales not only of the game, but of the system too. My take? Well, it was 1985 when it came out in North America. While the NES would show off superior graphics in the later years, compared to other baseball video games released around that time, the one for the NES was robust. Now, I'm not an expert in baseball in general myself, but I think Nintendo made the right decision to make this game an NES launch title. It also demonstrated exactly what the system could do. Tennis was released in Japan in January of 1984. The game features singles for one player and doubles matches for two. There are also five difficulty levels to which you can set the AI opponent. Level five is when the AI is red and gets more aggressive. Oh, and look at the official. It's me, Mario. This game is among my favorite tennis games in the video game industry. It really made me feel like I was actually there, though I'm not a tennis pro myself. However, winning is a problem for me, as even on level 1, I can't seem to win a single match, hence why this footage isn't very pleasing. Tennis would later be ported to the Game Boy as a launch title in North America, but we'll save that for a later video. Now here's an interesting launch title, Pinball. Again, self-explanatory. Of course, you use the D-pad to control the left flipper, and the A and B buttons to control the right flipper and to launch the ball. There's also a bonus stage if your ball hits a bonus hole in the lower screen. You control Mario as you bounce the ball towards a keypad of some sort to set Pauline free. The bonus stage is almost similar to Atari's Breakout, and is the most rewarding part of the game. Pinball was released on February 2nd, 1984 in Japan for the Famicom, and later that year on Nintendo's Versus Arcade system. North America got its first glimpse of the game in October of that year. The game was the first published Famicom project by the late Satoru Iwata, who would go on to run Nintendo from 2002 to 2015. This is one of my personal favorites among the NES launch titles, plus my favorite of all pinball video games. Yes, I have been getting the hang of video pinball on the Atari 2600, and Simon Kagura Peach Ball was pretty cool, but thanks to the bonus game with Mario and Pauline, Nintendo's pinball really stands out. If you're an NES fan, don't pass up this game. 
It's cheap and easy to find. Now on to a light gun title, Wild Gunman, released on February 18, 1984 in Japan for the Famicom. This game requires the NES Zapper to play, and like most light guns, it will only work on CRT monitors. As for the game itself, an outlaw approaches, and once his eyes flash and he yells, FIRE, that's your cue to open fire. If you take aim and fire within the outlaw's reaction time, you score, depending on how fast you shoot. 1,000 points for every tenth of a second remaining. The outlaw's bounty will also be added to your score. If you fail to fire in time, or if you fire too soon, you lose a life. Lose three, and it's over. Enemy times vary from four tenths of a second to a second and a half. In game A, you only go after one outlaw at a time. Pretty straightforward. In game B, you're pitted against two, and it's more difficult. You need much faster reflexes to get the hang of this mode and be warned that one of the outlaws might not even fire. Game C, Gang, is different from the others. You're in a saloon shootout, and gunmen pop up from behind the doors and windows of the building. Unlike games A and B, you don't need to wait for their signal to shoot. Just shoot at them the moment you see them. But be careful, you only get 15 bullets per wave. Again, lose three lives and it's game over. Oh, did I mention Wild Gunman actually got its start in 1974? but not as an actual video game. Instead, it was an electromechanical arcade game with full motion video projected onto a projection screen. This version was created by Gunpei Yokoi and was distributed in North America in 1976 by, of all companies, SEGA. Wild Gunman made a cameo appearance in the movie Back to the Future Part 2 during the Cafe 80s scene. Well, sort of. Protagonist Marty McFly spotted two boys, one of whom was played by Elijah Wood, playing the game and seemed fascinated. I'm a crack shot at this. The two boys, however, weren't so pleased with the way he played. You mean you have to use your hands? That's like a baby's toy. Mm. Baby's toy. In part three, Marty tried his luck in a mechanical shooting gallery. When asked how he shot so perfectly, he responded, 7-Eleven. That indicates that he'd been playing Wild Gunman at his local 7-Eleven. Now hold on a minute. How did Marty 7-Eleven get access to Wild Gunman when the NES had just launched a week prior to Marty's temporal point of origin in the first movie, October 25th, 1985? The NES's launch didn't get much press, and when it did, it wasn't nationwide. As for Wild Gunman having an arcade cabinet, it was never distributed in the Versus System format, and the Play Choice 10 arcade cabinets didn't debut until 1986. My theory is Marty 7-Eleven had access to a Famicom, a Famicom gun, and a copy of Wild Gunman. If that's true, you can't help but be impressed. My take on Wild Gunman? I love it. Another one of my favorite NES launch titles. Also one of the best light gun games I ever played but no light gun game will ever amount to this next launch title. Duck Hunt was released on April 21st, 1984 in Japan for the Famicom. It was one of the games packaged with the NES Deluxe set to help showcase what the Zapper could do. But this game didn't actually start out as a video game. In 1976, Gunpei Yokoi created Kosenju Duck Hunt, a small electromechanical toy game except this doesn't require a TV. Instead, it uses a projector that you could point at any blank wall. In the game, you're on a duck hunt, hence the title. A hunting dog sniffs out ducks, causing them to fly from the bushes in panic. Use the zapper to shoot a duck down, and the dog will grab it and score you, depending on which colored duck you shoot. The ducks with black feathers give you 500 points, the ducks with blue give you double those points, and those with red give you triple. Miss three times, the duck flies away, and... That laughing dog will be the death of me. Anyway, if you manage to shoot the required number of ducks for the round, you move on to the next round. Shoot all ten ducks, and you get bonus points. As you progress, the ducks fly faster, the goal increases, and the point values go up. Keep on hunting until you fail to shoot the required number of ducks. 
In game A, you get to shoot one duck at a time. If you should have enough skill to complete round 99, you'll go into round zero. And instead of an instant game over, you get slow flying ducks. After completing that round, you go back to round one. In game B, the game is the same, but with two ducks at a time, making each round faster. As with Wild Gunman, Game C is different in Duck Hunt. You get to shoot Clay Pigeons. Every shot scores you a thousand points. Shoot enough to advance to the next round. As usual, shooting all ten gives you a bonus, and point values go up as you proceed. This is my personal favorite of all Light Gun video games. Much as I despise that laughing dog, he does give me motivation to try harder. Despite a recent livestream, I prefer Game B over Game A. Oh, and did you know that you can control the ducks using the gamepad on a regular controller? You might be surprised to learn that Duck Hunt sold over 28 million copies worldwide, making it the second best-selling game on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Makes sense, seeing as it was bundled with Super Mario Bros. and many NES sets. The game made a cameo appearance in a 1991 commercial for Eagle's Nacho Cheese Chips, where Jack Klugman is playing Duck Hunt. His Odd Couple co-star, Tony Randall, tries to get him to try both the Eagle's Nacho Cheese Chips and chips from the other leading brand. Will you pay attention to me? But Klugman ends up using the zapper to zap him into the game. Don't let this happen to you. Duck Hunt proved to be so popular that it was incorporated into the Versus Arcade system with an added bonus stage where you actually get to shoot the dog. Of course, shooting the dog would mean ending the round. The dog and a duck became an unlockable fighter in the Super Smash Bros. series. They even got an amiibo toy. This game is pretty cheap and easy to find, and if you have an NES and a CRT TV, I highly recommend it. Of course, you can also get this game on the Wii U's Virtual Console for 5 bucks while you still can, but you will need the Wii Remote as your zapper. Golf another sports title for the NES's launch. Released in Japan for the Famicom on May 1st, 1984, it sold over 2 million copies in Japan alone. If anyone today has played a game in the Mario Golf series, the gameplay here should be familiar. How far the ball goes depends on the force of the player's swing, while the angle depends on the club you choose. Like in real life golf, the sooner you sink the ball into the hole, the better you score. Is that Mario with the T? Well, maybe. Captain Rainbow, a Wii game released only in Japan, referred to this golfer as Osan. Satoru Iwata once stated that Osan was a name intended for Mario during development of Donkey Kong. Frankly, I'm no expert in actual golf myself, so playing this game, not quite fun. But this game did set the standard for future golf video games. Nintendo released a Versus System version of the game called Versus Stroke and Match Golf in two different versions, a men's version and a ladies version. If you're into golf and have an NES, I suggest picking this up, or you may be better off playing NES Open Tournament Golf. The third and final Zapper entry among the NES launch titles, Hogan's Alley. It was released in Japan on June 12, 1984. Less than a year later, it was ported to Nintendo's Versus system, it's based on a shooting range of a training facility for the U.S. National Guard. In the game, you're in a shooting range firing upon cardboard cutouts of people. Three targets depict criminals, whereas the other three depict innocent people, a lady, a professor, and a cop. Your task? Shoot the bad guys as quickly as you can. Just be careful where you aim. Failing to shoot the enemy or hitting the wrong target costs you a life. Lose 10 and it's game over. In game A, you're given three targets per round. Once they face you, you have less than two seconds to identify who to shoot, aim, and open fire. Almost similar to Wild Gunman's Game B. In Game B of Hogan's Alley, you're in a simulated city block, similar to the alley in question. And the targets appear faster moving along rails. 
Like game A, shoot the enemy, not the innocent. Like the other Zapper games, game C is different from the others. It's called Trick Shot. Empty aluminum cans are flung through the air. Firing on them causes them to bounce up. Make sure they land safely on the tiny ledge in the middle or the three ledges on the left. How you score depends on where the can lands. The small ledge is worth 100 points. The upper left ledge is worth 300. Middle left, 800. Bottom left, 5,000. Miss 10 cans though, and the game ends. Overall, another fun zapper game. Now, before we get to the next NES launch title, you're probably wondering, how was I able to capture light gun footage? As we all know, light guns only work on CRT monitors. Luckily, the NES has both an RF port and an AV port. I hooked the NES up to my CRT via RF so as to use the zapper. I also hooked the system up via the AV cables to an upscaler. Case in point, the RetroTink 2X Pro, which I hook up to an HD capture card for capture. Fellow YouTuber Jeremy Parrish has a better method for using this using a PVM, but this is a good way to capture light gun games on a budget. In fact, this way makes it easier for me to stream any retro game using the original hardware. Now with that out of the way, let's move on to the next title. Kluku Land Released on November 22, 1984 in Japan, is a puzzle game developed by R&D1. You play as Bubbles, a blowfish. Your task is to guide her through a maze to uncover the hidden ingots that take the form of a picture, all while trying to dispatch the Unira sea urchins and avoiding black holes. To kill the Unira, Bubbles fires sound waves, paralyzing them. Push the paralyzed Unira towards a wall, and you score points. To change Bubbles' direction, push the appropriate direction on the D-pad the moment she reaches a turning pole. At that point, she'll grab it and turn the desired direction. This part of the game requires perfect timing. To me, it's one of the more frustrating NES launch titles, but at the same time, it can be fun to play. It's always satisfying to crush those Unira for more points than you'd get for the time bonus. The game was ported to Nintendo's Versus system later in 1984 as well as the Famicom Disk System in 1992 as one of the last titles for the add-on. This is one of the more uncommon launch titles, going for around $40 to $50 on average, but if you want to play this game on a budget, the arcade version is available on the Nintendo Switch eShop for $8, and the NES version is available to play for free to Nintendo Switch Online subscribers. Excite Bike, released on October 30th, 1984 in Japan, is a motocross racing game directed, produced, and designed by Shigeru Miyamoto and programmed by Toshihiko Nakago. The game consists of five tracks. Selection A is a time trial, where you're to guide your racer through the track to try and make the top three so as to advance to the next course. The A button is your accelerator. Letting it go causes the bike to brake. The B button is the turbo, allowing your bike to run faster but don't hold that B button for too long or the engine will overheat and your bike will be disabled for 5 seconds to cool down. Now this is another game that requires precise movement. One wrong move could knock you off the bike and into the field, forcing you to spend about 5 seconds to get back in the race, but you can mash the A button if you want to continue sooner. When going up a ramp, hold left on the D-pad. When you land on the downward side of the ramp, please hold right. I can't stress it enough. Those bumps on the track pop a wheelie while holding left for a brief moment. Otherwise, you'll trip. Selection B is pretty much the same, but with CPU players. This gives the game more obstacles. Design. Loved by fans, but overlooked by Nintendo of America. You get to design your own courses. However, it's quite a problem, at least for the North American release. Simply put, you create your own custom tracks on which to race. The problem is, you can't actually save them on the NES version. Once you turn off the game, it's gone. 
the save and load options are inoperable. These features were operable in the Famicom version, but that required the Famicom Family Basic Keyboard and the Famicom Data Recorder. In 1988, Nintendo released Versus Excite Bike for the Famicom Disk System, mostly based on the Versus System port, but with a few major changes. Not only can you save your custom tracks to the rewritable floppy disks, but there's also different music, different color palettes, and a two-player mode called Versus Excite. Sadly, Versus Excite Bike never hit stateside. At least not until 2019, when it was made available on the Nintendo Switch Online service. Now, I've had issues with this game. I hardly, if ever, got past the fifth track. It's always the most frustrating. My timing with the controller is usually way off. Regardless, it helps me keep on going. Excitebike went on to sell more than 4 million copies. It became one of the top 10 best-selling NES games. It's not one of my personal favorites of the system, mind you, but it being a big seller in its time, and having spawned a few sequels for the Nintendo 64 and Wii, I suggest checking it out. Ice Climber This vertical platform game was released on January 30th, 1985 in Japan. The game stars Popo and Nana, a pair of Eskimos who make their way up 32 icy mountains to retrieve stolen vegetables from a condor. In single player mode, you control Popo. To advance to the next layer of the mountain, you have to break the ice on the floor above with your mallet, while avoiding enemies called topies and nitpickers. The topies are yeti-like creatures who fill in the floor holes faster than you can make them. In the Famicom version, they're seals. The nitpickers are birds who can fly through multiple floors of ice. Speedo-wearing polar bears appear if you take too long to advance. They push the screen down to move to the next layer of the mountain. You lose a life by either taking a hit from either a topi, a nitpicker, or a falling icicle, or by falling from the screen. Some of the floors are breakable, while some aren't. Others tend to act like conveyor belts. After scaling eight floors of ice, you advance to the bonus round at the peak of the mountain. There, grab as many stolen vegetables as you can in 40 seconds. Every vegetable obtained scores you. Fall off and the bonus round ends, but you don't lose any lives. Once you reach the top, you face off against the condor. Grab him before time runs out to gain extra points. If you grab an ear of corn, you get an extra life. The process is repeated until you lose all your lives. Once you successfully scale the 30 second mountain, it's back to the first. In two-player mode, gameplay is the same, but obviously with two players either competing or cooperating. Player 1 controls Popo, while player 2 controls Nana. Now this game, the controls are where the game gets some flack. They tend to get pretty laggy. Other than that, another cool NES launch title. This game was ported to the Versus system, as well as the Famicom Disk system, the Game Boy Advance, Virtual Console, and the Nintendo Switch among other platforms. The Ice Climbers also made their way to the Super Smash Bros. series. The original cart is pretty inexpensive, but when gaming on a budget, I'd recommend playing it on the Switch. Next is Soccer, another sports title. It was released on April 9, 1985 in Japan. Simply put, it's soccer. Kick the ball into the opposing goal to score. You play in either 15, 30, or 45 minute halves. There are five skill levels, and seven teams are represented. That's pretty much all I can say about the gameplay. This was one of the first NES sports titles I managed to beat since 2019 when I got into collecting. And I can personally consider this my all-time favorite 8-bit sports game. It takes me back to my high school days playing soccer with classmates back in the 2000s. As for critics, Computer and Video Games Magazine gave it a score of 83%, saying it was among the best home console versions of the sport at the time. I urge you collectors to pick it up if you don't have one already. Then again, most of you probably already have considering how inexpensive it is these days.
Here we have another NES launch title in the programmable series, Wrecking Crew. This vertical scrolling game was released in Japan on June 18, 1985. You play as Mario as you use your trusty hammer to destroy every object on one level before progressing to the next. Hammering bombs will demolish adjacent lines of objects while sending you plummeting through the bottommost ground on the level. But beware of the fireballs, the eggplant man, the gotcha wrenches, and form and spike. You can lure enemies through a set of doors and keep them at bay as you progress. While coming into contact with the other three enemies is hazardous, bumping into form and spike can send you plummeting to the bottom of the stage. Hammer the wall in front of where Spike is hiding to knock him to the floor. Every few stages, you get to play a bonus game where you compete against Spike to find a hidden coin for bonus points. Some stages can contain a prize bomb. These prizes award you extra points. One example is the Golden Hammer, which can destroy objects and enemies fast. In some stages, there's also hidden letters that spell Mario. Find them in the right order to gain an extra life. Make one mistake and you won't see them for the rest of the stage. There's also a two-player mode, and player two takes control of Luigi. Yes, Luigi appears in this game too, albeit in unusual colors. As for design mode, similar to Excitebike, you can create your own stages. However, unlike the Famicom version, Trying to save your creations can cause the game to crash. However, some re-releases fix this problem. Yep, another worthwhile launch title. It does take some strategy to get through all 100 stages, but it does make for a decent game. The game got a Versus System port, as well as ports for the Famicom Disk System, Game Boy Advance, Virtual Console, and Nintendo Switch Online. The original card is a little pricey nowadays, but if you can find one, it's well worth it. Kung Fu, a port of Irem's arcade game Spartan X, or Kung Fu Master in North America. Released on June 21st, 1985 in Japan, this side-scrolling beat-em-up takes place in the Devil's Temple, where you play as Thomas traversing through the temple to rescue his girlfriend Sylvia from the evil Mr. X. And I'm not talking about the Marvel supervillain. At the title screen, you choose from either the normal Game A or the challenging Game B. Whichever one you choose, you guide Thomas through five floors of the temple to fend off Mr. X's underlings. Pressing A lands a punch. Pressing B lands a kick. To dodge enemy attacks, jump by pressing up on the D-pad or crouch by pressing down. Pressing A or B simultaneously with up or down on the D-pad makes for stronger attacks. The grippers can drain your energy by latching onto Thomas if they get too close. Mashing left and right on the D-pad helps you break free. One attack can take them out. The knife throwers can chuck knives at you at your head or your feet. Each one takes two hits to beat. The Tom Toms, they're small but mighty. They can only be hit by a crouching attack. And here's a little secret for those going for a high score. If the 12th enemy on each stage you beat is a gripper and you hit him with a jump kick, it's worth 5,000 points. This should help because scoring 50,000 gives you an extra life. Floor 1 consists of only the grippers and knife throwers. The first boss is the sick fighter. Simply get as close as you can to attack him and render him powerless. Floor 2 has very annoying obstacles that fall from the ceiling in the first four sections. None ever more annoying than the snakes. Completely invincible. But once you go through those first four sections, you only have to deal with the standard underlings, including the tom-toms, before battling the boomerang fighter boss. Like the first boss, get as close to the boomerang fighter as you can for attacks while avoiding his boomerangs. Floor 3 is pretty much the same as the first, except Tom Toms are added. The giant is the boss on this floor. His attacks are brutal. But an initial forward jump kick and an array of low punches can help take him out quickly. Floor 4 features poisonous moths. I'd recommend just avoiding them. For the faster ones, you'll eventually have to punch or kick them. After the first three sections, you'll pretty much be at ease before battling the Black Magician boss. He throws high fireballs at Thomas, so ducking is simple, but his method of defense is transporting himself a few inches back. When you do get close enough, low punches are the key to beating him. The fifth and final floor feels like a breeze. 
simply dispatch your enemies before ultimately battling Mr. X. But don't expect much of a challenge from him. Close range, low sweeping kicks are his Achilles heel. Once you defeat Mr. X, you'll finally save Sylvia. But when that's over, the game loops back to the first floor. No matter how many times you beat the game, you'll keep on until you lose your last life. Don't believe those urban legends. Irem released a sequel to Spartan X for the Famicom in 1991, and Kung Fu 2 was teased for the NES, but it never actually came out. I consider this one one of the best beat-em-ups on the NES, despite its simplicity. Another game worth picking up, another easy-to-find game at a low price today. Now before we get to the next two games, let's inspect Rob the Robot's functionality. He requires four AA batteries. Within Rob's eyes are photosensitive lenses. The test feature in each of the compatible games will transmit a signal to these eyes through a CRT monitor with green and black flashes. Once the red light on top of Rob's head lights up, he's all set. The fun thing about these games is that neither of them were actually localized. To save time, Nintendo of America took the Famicom versions of the games and added a pin adapter so they could work on a Nintendo Entertainment System. Pretty clever. Surprisingly, my copy of Gyromite has a regular board compared to my copy of Stack Up. Let's begin with Stack Up. The game was released alongside the Family Computer Robot on July 26, 1985 in Japan. Packaged with the game were five different colored blocks and five trays, along with a set of hands to help Rob grab the blocks. In this game, there's a direct feature to test out Rob's movements in a minigame. You have to arrange the colored blocks to match the picture on the right. The par on the upper left corner means it's the average number of steps it should take to meet the goal. Once you do so, press start to let the game know you're ready for the next stage. This is what's called a trust system. It assumes you met the goal and scores you accordingly. Memory is a pretty tricky game. You have to input a chain of commands for Rob to move the blocks in order to match the picture but you have to input every command BEFORE letting Rob move. In one player bingo, you control Professor Hector in a bingo-like grid. When five blocks in a row are pressed on, they'll input a Rob command. The aim of the game is to match the picture on the screen, except the colors don't matter. But beware of Flipper and Spike. Flipper can hop on buttons to try and input his own commands to Rob, putting you at a disadvantage, while Spike simply drifts around the grid randomly and can block your path. Run into either, and Professor Hector gets knocked off the grid. Again, once you've matched the picture, press start to finish. In two-player bingo, you and an opponent each start with one block. Player 1 takes trays 1 and 2 and controls Professor Hector, while Player 2 takes trays 4 and 5 and controls Professor Vector. The middle tray contains the remaining 3 blocks. Each player competes to input commands to Rob and grab the most blocks in 5 minutes. Only when time runs out will the game end. Gyromite was released on August 13, 1985 in Japan. In North America, it came packaged with the NES Deluxe set with Rob and the pieces needed for Gyromite. Two gyros, a gyro holder, a gyro spinner, a controller tray, and a set of claws for Rob to pick up the gyros. The gyro spinner requires a D battery to spin a gyro. In Gyromite, you take the first controller while the second goes in Rob's controller tray. Unlike Stack Up, Gyromite's Direct is simply a practice room. In Game A, you take control of Professor Hector and the goal is to help him grab every set of dynamite sticks in the room before time expires. But watch out for the enemy Smix. To render the Smix temporarily harmless, pick up a turnip, then put it down in front of the Smix to eat. Blocking your way are red and blue pipes. When using Rob, press start to enter the command screen. 
using the D-pad and BNA buttons on the first controller input commands. The D-pad changes the direction of Rob's arms, A opens his arms, and B closes them. Have Rob grab a gyro to press down on the appropriate color. That'll press the A or B button on the controller in the tray. Some stages require pushing down on both buttons. That's where the gyro spinner comes in. While it's still spinning, grab the gyro and press down on one button to keep it held down while you go for the other. Yes, it is a struggle to finish when using Rob. Sometimes you're probably better off playing game A without Rob. Game A also has a two-player mode, with Professor Vector acting as the second player's avatar, except you have to share the first controller with your opponent. Moving on to game B, it's strictly a single-player game. You have no control over the sleepwalking Professor Hector. You have to make sure he reaches the end safely. You'll need the second controller to move those pipes. With Rob, it's more fun than game A, but it can still be a pain. My take on these Rob compatible games? Stack Up is no fun without Rob. And even so, it wasn't worth paying more than the price of an average NES title back in 1985. It was $35 when it first came out in North America, while most NES games retail for $25 to $30. Today, Stack Up is the most expensive and hardest to find NES launch title, going for around $100 loose or $500 complete in box. The Famicom version, however, does go for a lot less, even complete. Gyromite was more fun, but without Rob, it does get boring as you progress through stages. But I really love the background music. It's cheap and easy to find loose in today's market. Getting the original accessories, however, is a different story. As for Rob the Robot, when the NES was released nationwide in the summer of 1986, he was sold separately for $50 without the accessories for his games. A few years later, once the NES finally took off, Rob and his games were quietly discontinued. According to the Computer Entertainer Newsletter, Nintendo planned four more games for the Robot series, but they never came out. Today, Rob is considered a collector's item. If you have a good working unit, you have my congrats. They're pretty hard to find. But Rob will always be remembered for helping get the Nintendo Entertainment System into North American stores after the video game crash of 1983. To this day, Rob makes appearances in numerous Nintendo games, especially Super Smash Brothers. Nintendo even released an amiibo toy in his image. Next up is Ten Yard Fight, a sports title developed by Iron, makers of Kung Fu. The game was released in Japan on August 30th, 1985 for the Famicom. It's a port of Irem's 1983 American football arcade game. It's a vertical scrolling game viewed in a top-down perspective. You alternate between offense and defense, something not present in the original arcade game. Also exclusive to the home console version is a two-player option. When playing offense, you take control of the quarterback. Press A to pass to the receiver, or B to throw a lateral pass to one of the adjacent running backs. Keep playing until you fail to get a first down, or until you reach the end zone for a touchdown. When you succeed in the ladder, you go for the extra point. On defense, you control the kicker on kickoff, trying to tackle an opponent. When regular play continues, you get to press A or B to choose from two players. Press A or B to perform a diving tackle against the player with the ball. When punting or performing a field goal, press down on the D-pad in tandem with the A button to go into kicking mode. Move the blue arrow with the D-pad to aim, then press A to kick. Each game has two 30-minute halves. There are five levels, high school, college, professional, playoff, and the Super Bowl. Win a game to proceed to the next level. Personally, I don't think this game is as much fun as the other sports titles in the NES launch lineup. It's worth picking up if you're a collector, but if you really want to play football on the NES, try Tecmo Bowl. We saved the best launch title for last, Super Mario Bros. There's so much more of this game to talk about than in this episode, so I'll save that for a future episode. 
Super Mario Bros. was released on September 13, 1985 in Japan as a successor to the Mario Bros. arcade game. The game was designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Donkey Kong, alongside Takashi Tezuka. This wasn't exactly their first project together. Before Super Mario Bros., Miyamoto and Tezuka designed Devil World, a maze game that never saw the light of day in North America due to Nintendo of America's policies against using religious icons. In this side-scrolling platform game, you control Mario, an Italian plumber traversing through eight worlds of the Mushroom Kingdom to save Princess Toadstool, aka Princess Peach, from the evil Bowser, King of the Koopas. In each stage, you have to watch out for enemies like Koopa Troopas, Goombas, Buzzy Beetles, Hammer Brothers, and many others. There are power-ups to help you on your journey. Super Mushrooms, which make Mario grow bigger, Fire Flowers, which let him shoot fireballs, and Super Stars, which make him temporarily invincible. At the fourth stage of each world, you make your way through a castle to battle a fake Bowser, beat him by hitting the axe behind him or shooting fireballs at him repeatedly if equipped with a fire flower. In the first five worlds, Bowser simply shoots fire. In worlds six and seven, he throws hammers. In the final stage, the real Bowser does both. After beating the game, you're presented with a new task, a hard mode. At the startup screen, you can select a world by pressing B. In this hard mode, Goombas are replaced by Buzzy Beetles. Enemies are much faster, and lifts are shorter, among other things. Super Mario Bros. went on to sell more than 40 million copies worldwide. It became the best-selling game on the Nintendo Entertainment System. When combined with re-releases, including Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Virtual Console, etc., over 50 million copies were sold. The game's popularity brought about numerous sequels, spin-offs, Game & Watch versions, three North American animated series, Japanese anime projects, and a feature film. In the summer of 1986, Nintendo began shipping the Nintendo Entertainment System nationwide with a promotional campaign of over $20 million and support from many a major retailer. Commercials aired all over the United States with the slogan, Now you're playing with power. With the nationwide launch came more console packages. The control deck set included just the NES, two controllers, and the needed hookups. Another control deck set also included Super Mario Brothers. As the years went by, more console packages came along, such as a control deck set with the official Nintendo Player's Guide instead of a game, as well as the action set, which contained the system, two controllers, a zapper gun, and a cartridge containing Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt. Meanwhile, competition entered the video game market. Atari Corporation released the Atari 7800, and Sega released the Master System. Although both consoles were impressive, Nintendo had command of the majority of the video game market partly because of Nintendo's licensing policies for third-party games, but we'll save that story for another time. Back in Japan, Nintendo's success with the Famicom continued. In 1986, Nintendo released the Famicom Disk System, an add-on that played games using inexpensive rewritable floppy disks. They could hold more data than a standard cartridge. Several franchises such as The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, and Castlevania debuted on the Disk System. It even had a sequel to Super Mario Bros., albeit very difficult. But as time went on, chip prices started dropping, resulting in more inexpensive cartridges. This, among others, forced Nintendo to pull the plug on the disc system. As for North America, more and more popular titles came out, including some games that never hit Japan, like Star Tropics. Even after they came out with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991, Nintendo of America continued to support the NES. In 1993, they released a smaller model of the NES, Model 101. It retailed for only $50. The carts loaded on the top this time. A huge improvement over the front loading design. But that's a story for another video. In 1994, Nintendo released the new Famicom, or AV Famicom, in Japan. 
Compared to the top-loading NES, the AV Famicom has AV out, albeit only outputting composite video, and the top surface is flat so as to support the Famicom Disk System RAM adapter. Even after Nintendo pulled the plug on the NES in 1995, NES titles had been re-released in various formats, including Nintendo's Virtual Console and Nintendo Switch Online Surfaces. This is the NES Mini. In 2016, Nintendo released this with 30 built-in games. It was a hot Christmas item. Throughout its lifespan, the Nintendo Entertainment System left a profound impact all over the United States, and eventually the whole world. Children would gloat about their experiences with Nintendo and or share some tips. When you get to those things that go up and down, you just jump on them. There were World of Nintendo sections in stores all over, dedicated to selling all sorts of Nintendo merchandising, such as lunchboxes, clothing, backpacks, toys, board games, and of course, Nintendo games and accessories, as well as the system itself. There were even kiosks in which players could try out new games. In 1987, Gail Tilden and Howard Phillips started the Nintendo Fun Club, a free-to-join fan club dedicated to Nintendo. It featured tips and tricks for games, news of upcoming games, and comics. In the summer of 1988, after receiving over half a million subscribers, the Fun Club was scrapped in favor of the paid subscription magazine known as Nintendo Power. Fun Club members received the very first issue free of charge. With Nintendo Power also came the Nintendo Power Line, a hotline that provided tips and tricks for gamers on how to get through games. Have you ever been to the mansion that has the eyeball in it? There were also cartoon shows based on Nintendo franchises, such as the Super Mario Bros. Super Show and Captain N the Game Master. Let's not forget Nintendo's cross-promotions with companies such as Pepsi, Hostess, and Nabisco. In 1989, Nintendo and Universal Pictures collaborated on a film featuring a slew of Nintendo products, The Wizard. In 1990, McDonald's released a set of Super Mario Bros. 3 Happy Meal toys. That same year, Valiant Comics published the Nintendo Comics System, a comic book series featuring Nintendo characters. In addition, Nintendo held the very first eSports event, the Nintendo World Championships. But not everything went well for Nintendo. For example, in the 90s, the Federal Trade Commission stuck their noses into the company. They interviewed many retailers. The FTC accused Nintendo of antitrust violations and price fixing. Nintendo fixed prices with their dealers, wouldn't allow dealers to discount, and as a result, consumers that tried to comparison shop were just uh, wasting their time. To maintain goodwill and avoid a trial, Nintendo was ordered to send $25 million worth of coupons to anyone who purchased their products between June of 1988 and December of 1990. These coupons were good for $5 off the purchase of any Nintendo product. But none of these issues were much of an inconvenience. Nintendo wound up selling almost 62 million NES and Famicom units worldwide. And up until the success of the Nintendo Wii and the Nintendo Switch, it was Nintendo's best-selling home console. When looking back on their memories with video games, gamers most often think of the Nintendo Entertainment System. A system with nostalgia. A system that shaped the industry. A system that brought people closer together. Playing Super Mario Brothers, or any game on the Nintendo Entertainment System, takes me back to 1991, when I first got into video games. I saw my uncle playing Super Mario Brothers on his Nintendo Entertainment System. He knew how intrigued I was, so he let me play for a while, and that got me into video games. And in 1992, I got a Super Nintendo Entertainment System for Christmas, with a copy of Super Mario World. I've been hooked on video games ever since. Most collectors, such as myself, have the original NES, but if you have the NES Model 101, congrats! It's pretty hard to find these days. Well. That wraps up this edition of Gaming the Light. Until next time, happy gaming.